Okay, we're going to try this one more time. This is actually my third attempt to try to uh, record this video, so hopefully I don't mix anything up too badly this time. Uh, first thing is the periodic table that you see on the screen here is uh, available to you. It's linked in the Schoology folder for atoms and the periodic table. I suggest you use this one rather than another one that you could find online because I made a couple of changes for ease of use that could be a little different. Notably, the numbers above the columns in the upper right um, are often 13, 14, 15, um, but we're using for our uh, ease of use, we're going to use just straight three through uh, eight. There's no problem doing that. Um, even a chemist will understand the reasoning. So we're going we're gonna to go with it that way. Um, but do have this available to you. You Good news is you don't have to memorize any part of it. Um, you ne really never should for any science class. Instead, you've got to know how to use it because you can well, almost always have access to one of these in any future class that you take. Um, there are several parts that we want to talk about. The previous videos I actually found after planning this week, and I included them Although they're, you know, they, they extend how much I want you to do, it's half an hour total, I found them really informative um, and they gave you a lot of context for what we're going to talk about. So then I don't have to do that in m my voice. We can have a little bit more polished uh, presenter for that. But I do want to go through and highlight some of the things that were mentioned in those videos and uh, describe how can we use that information going forward to learn more about the atoms uh, based on what information is actually listed in the periodic table and where each one is in the periodic table and how that's important. So um, first one here is that we've got a, a legend up top here and yeah and um, that's a legend for us, and, and it shows us a bunch of the information, uh, but it's sort of encoded, right? We have to know what each of those parts is. So first part is symbol here, which is just an abbreviation that's often used for the each different element, especially if you're writing chemical formulas, because it shortens it so much. They're always a capital letter, followed by a lowercase letter, if there is a second letter, and they are derived from their name, and a lot of those make sense, like hydrogen over here, or we see lithium underneath it, beryllium. All of those are making a lot of sense, but there are certain ones that don't seem to make sense, like uh, sodium here, or uh, iron, copper, silver, gold, mercury. And that's because when this was being developed, the periodic table was being developed, uh, Latin was the accepted language of science. So all of the learned people would uh, pick up Latin and it would be the classical language. And so a lot of these names are actually, or the symbols are actually derived from their Latin names. So in uh, Latin, sodium would have been called natrium, iron, ferrum, copper, cuprum, uh, silver is argentum, gold is aurum, mercury is a tough one to say, that's hydrogentum. Uh, basically means liquid silver, which makes sense for mercury. But that's where a lot of these names come. So there is another weird one here, um, W for tungsten. That comes from the mineral that it's found in, which it was called wolframite. And these names predate our knowledge of, uh, of atoms or anything like that by a lot. So that's why we've got uh, some weird names here. The, the materials were known long before we knew that they were atoms and could classify them in this way. Next piece of information is the round number, the whole number on each tile. And that's what organizes this from top to bottom and left to right. So we see hydrogen is one, helium is two, lithium is three, beryllium is four, and so forth. We, we read left to right and then go down to the next line just as though we're reading a book. That is the atomic number, and that tells us a couple things about the element and all atoms in that. And um, 
importantly, first off, that is the number of protons that we would find in every atom of that element, uh, every single atom in an existence. So every single thing with one proton is hydrogen. Every single thing with four protons is beryllium. And there's, n there's no way to change that. If they have a different number, they're a different element. If it, you can't have a beryllium with three protons, because that's what lithium is. And that defines so much of the uh, physical character and chemical characteristics of the atom that to change that number changes the atom entirely. So first off, that is the number of protons that we find in the nucleus. We often abbreviate that as a P plus because protons are positive. Now, in all of the atoms that we're looking at right now, we are going to be dealing with neutral atoms, meaning electrically neutral. And if these have differing and increasing amounts of protons, that means in order to be neutral, they've got to have negative charges in equal amount or they wouldn't be neutral. So this also tells us the number of total electrons in the atom or, or surrounding the atom because electrons are negative. And because of that, we abbreviate it with little e minus. So that atomic number actually tells us quite a bit about both of those things. The next part here, the atomic weight, often called the atomic mass, is um, an average value. So he mentioned in the videos that the, the example of silver, where we know exactly how many protons each atom of silver has, I can go find it there, always has a or 47 protons. But um, this atomic weight is the entire weight, the average entire weight of the atom, because also in that atom we have a bunch of neutrons. And in a general way, you can use the, uh, the atomic weight here to help you figure out how many neutrons there are, at least approximately, because that atomic weight is about the sum of protons and neutrons, but it is an average. And the important thing about this being an average is that any individual, I'm going to finish writing this before I finish talking, of protons and neutrons. Neutrons, by the way, since they are neutral, we symbolize this with a little n naught or n zero. Um, now, the reason this is an average is that you can actually have uh, atoms of the same kind, so all silver, for example, with differing number of neutrons. They all have 47 protons, but some of them will have 60 neutrons and some of them will have 62 neutrons. And if you get a big sampling of this that's natural, you will find that they're, they're mixed and they're average mass comes out to 107.87. So this tells us about the relative amounts of the, of the different types of atoms, which are called isotopes, but it doesn't tell us exactly how, which ones are present. For example, in uh, silver, we don't know if the uh, masses are 107, meaning that there would be 60 neutrons, and 108 eight, meaning there would be 61, or if they're, the masses that are possible in nature are 106 and 109, and how they combine, it just tells us the average. So later this week, we're going, we are going to explore that a little bit. So how do we know which one, which isotopes, which uh, sets of, nu of neutrons are present? Um, but that is for another day. And then uh, finally, we have the name, which is the obvious part there. There are two other really important features to this, which I alluded to earlier. They're the numbers along the top and the numbers along the sides of each column, and those are related to the electrons. So in your lab, you saw that when you put one the first electron on an atom, it always goes into that inner ring. Second electron also always goes into that inner ring. And then electrons three through 10 go on the second ring. Those are referred to as shells, and that is what 
the number over here, the row numbers, refer to. So the row number tells you how many shells of electrons the atoms in that row have. So for example, everything in row one, which is just hydrogen and helium, they have one shell. Any uh, atoms beyond that will have already filled that first shell and we'll be working on another one. So lithium, beryllium, and then you skip across to boron, carbon, all the way through neon. They have filled their first shell and they are working on shell number two. So they all have two shells of electrons. The uh, ones in the third row, sodium through argon, those are all filling shell number three. So that's what the, the number across the side or on the side means. The numbers across the top here, the column numbers, those are telling us how many electrons are in the outermost el uh, electron shell. And that is really important because that's what's uh, used in chemistry. That's, this is the outermost, outermost part of a an atom, and it's what interacts with other atoms around it. And this is one of the things that Mendeleev recognized without knowing that there were even atoms or that there were uh, electrons that played an important role in his work that he set up these columns and said everything in these columns behaves very similarly to the other things in the column. So for example, if we take column seven here, these are called the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Um, all of those behave similarly in a chemical nature because they all have seven uh, electrons in their outer part of their shell and they lack just one to fill that shell up. So they react similarly to other atoms around it. Those in column eight here are called the noble gases. They're the ones with full shells. And so if you are a keen observer here, you'll recognize a, a couple things with that statement. One, the element helium has two protons. So that means a neutral atom would only have two electrons. It can't possibly have eight electrons in its outer shell because it only has two total. But we put it over here because two electrons fills up that very first shell. And once you get a third electron, it goes into the second shell. So helium belongs here because its shell is full, just like neons, argons, kryptons, and so forth down the road. It just so happens that it doesn't behave nicely with that number. Now you might ask, what about these two rows down at the bottom? They're labeled the lanthanides and the actinides. Well, those belong in with the rest. That's why the little arrows are here, but um, they would make the periodic table super wide. You saw the, the uh, paper copy uh, that, our, that the narrator, the host was showing. Um, they would actually widen this quite a bit. And I do have an example that can show you that my expanded periodic table. So this is what it would look like if we did have them in their place. So the, the elements on the top of that, namely cerium all the way over to lutetium, I think. Yep. Those are filling part of their sixth uh, shell of electrons. And so they belong in row six. And the ones thorium below it, thorium to lawrencium, they're filling shell number seven. But you notice where the, all these steps come in. These are those different orbitals that he was talking about. And this is where the shapes and the, the nitty gritty of, the chemi uh, of chemistry get a little tough because each of those um, represents, each of those steps represents a different set of suborbitals, different shapes that the electrons go in. And he highlighted this. So the, the first two columns 
which would be columns one and two, but would also include helium over here since it's filling that shell. They're filling up a part of the shell that looks like a sphere. Down below, I've got a, an illustration of that. And the way I remember it is that S, that's called the S orbital. And it S starts, or sphere, sphere starts with S. Um, every shell, every uh, new shell has one of those on its inner part. So it's uh, the very first shell, that's all it contains, just two electrons that can fit into that sphere. Then when we go down to the next row, lithium and beryllium are starting to fill another sphere that is a bit bigger. So we'd have one tiny sphere already filled in lithium, and then its next electron goes in a bigger uh, sphere around it, and beryllium same way. It starts off with one uh, that's already full on the inside, and then the next one goes around. And in fact, everything in this column, in columns one and two there, are filling their outermost electrons going into a sphere. It's just getting bigger and bigger as you get more and more shells. So they've already filled up the layers in uh, underneath that. Then we've got um, the next one to fill is uh, often the p, is the p orbital, and that's over here on the right. P, as I recall, it, um, I don't know that these have meaning. This is just how mnemonic that I use. They look like petals. So um, they can, it can, P orbital can hold up to six, which is why there are one, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six in that area. And so each petal can hold one and there are six petals. So they are shown down below. So as we're getting to neon, or argon over there, it would actually be all six of these joined. So one would be along the, shown as the x-axis, one would be along, or a pair, would be along the y-axis, and then another pair would be along the z. So you'd kind of get something like this, and they'd just overlap in the center. So you'd have a sphere in the center, that's that s, and then you'd have a petal going this way, this way, each way, like so holding the extras. That's why there are six here, because those weird shapes hold six. Then you'd start filling, um, the D shell is the next sort of shape, and that's actually can hold up to 10. It includes the column three over there that's now on the left, and then it gets split by the uh, F orbital when that F orbital is present, and then regain, and then starts filling the, those again. So those are sort of a don't have a donut shape involved. Like I've got the illustration here as part of it. And that's how I remember D. And then finally, the biggest shells, shell six and seven, actually get um, the F orbital that starts to fill up. And, and I don't have a mnemonic for this. I'm sure several uh, chemists probably do, and I'm not going to repeat it here. Um, but, um, all of these shells do complicate chemistry because they fill at different rates. But interestingly, each uh, shell as you go down, as it gets bigger and bigger, they will have the similar shapes. They will just be outside the other ones. So we're kind of stacking on much, much bigger layers of atoms. We do not need to, to use those in this class. I, I'm discussing it here and we include and included it in the other videos because it's of interest and it will be uh, more useful as you take chemistry in the future. Um, but for right now, what I want you to remember, I'm going to go back to our other periodic table, is um, the use of those two uh, sets of numbers that the ones on the left tell us how many total shells of electrons an atom will have and the numbers across the top will tell us how many are in the outer layer. Now, the, the reason I renumbered here, going from, uh, you see one, two, and then we jump down to three to 12. Remember, these are the different types of orbitals. And so I re started renumbering at three here because a lot of the chemistry that you'll do starting out is going to be involving the nice, easily predicted ones, which are, this group and that group. And so it's useful to think of them, you mentioned the octet rule in the, uh, uh, what, the last video. It's useful to think of them in eights and rather than going up to 18. But as you progress in chemistry, if you take it in college and it, the uh, 
advanced courses here at high school. You will see some of that as well. Okay. Um, I think that covers so what we need to on how the periodic table is organized. Um, if you have questions, shoot them to me. But for, for our purposes, those numbers are the useful bits as a starting point.